And welcome, Calvary. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Is it great to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we enter into worship this morning, musical worship, and we sing about the amazing grace of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for that grace. Let's put our hands together this morning as we worship. If you're watching online, good morning to you as well. If you're viewing us via TV, good morning. It's great to have you this morning. Let's sing it together. Who breaks the power? Thank you, Lord. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of all kings. Who shakes the whole earth? Holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Here it is. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love that you would take my place. shall bring any charge against God's elect. It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? 
who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Hallelujah. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or even sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Romans 31, 8 30, excuse me, Romans 8, 31 through 36. Let's lift this up. Jesus made it up. I hear the Savior say. your name, Father. Only you can wash me white as
your name. The one and only name that every knee shall bow. Jesus. Come on, church. Let's give him some praise this morning. Father, we just bow before your great name, before your throne in heaven. And Father, we proclaim this morning that you are good because that is just who you are. Lord, because of your goodness, we have received things that we did not deserve. And Lord, I realize that there are some in here right now that are having a really hard time singing this song because our perspective is changed. Because your definition of good is so much different than ours. Sometimes we focus so much on the tangible or the, the things that meet our physical needs. But Lord, you satisfy with the living water and the bread of life. And so, Lord, I pray that you would ch change our focus this morning onto you and your goodness because it's for your glory, not for our comfort. It's for your glory, not for our wants. It's for your glory, not for what we can get out of our Christianity, what benefits us, but it's for your glory. And so, Lord, I pray right now for those requests, Lord, that are unspoken, that some have so earnestly been praying for, and that maybe you have said wait or, or maybe said no for their good, for their benefit, for things that we don't even understand, Lord. And, Lord, that we have requests that are being lifted up. Lord, we lift up uh, Bill and Amanda Stokes and their children, Lord, as they will be packing up and moving. And Lord, it's not for, for our good that they're doing it, Lord, but it's for your glory. Lord, that you are moving them to Utah and that we will miss them greatly. But Lord, you have great plans for them. And you go before them and they are going to see your goodness, Father. They've already seen some of your goodness through just packing up and moving and and you providing for them and and you're going to even show them more and more of you and i know that you will use them mightily wherever you plant them lord and so we just uh, lift them up to you right now as they're in this final week and all the crazy details that go into moving across country lord and the things that may not be set in stone yet that they still need you to provide for lord we just lift them up and we thank you for blessing us with them here at Calvary for as long as you have and the ministries that they've had here and the friendships that they've had. And so, Lord, we just lift them up. Lord, we lift up Paula Barton, who is one of our precious missionaries, Lord, that we serve and they've have been a part of our church here. And we sent them out, Lord, to Texas and the border of Mexico, Lord. And Lord, we just uh, lift up Paula as her father is suffering from cancer and they found more in his brain, Lord, and we just lift them up because I know how difficult it is to be so far away from your family during such a difficult time. And so, Lord, we know that your hand is on him and we know, again, this is for your glory. Lord, would you show yourself mightily in this situation? Would you be with Paula and Travis and their kids as they're far away from them, Lord, but knowing that he is in the best hands, in your hands, Father. And so, Lord, I just pray for this service now, Lord, for our hearts that are in this place. Again, for the situations that weren't even spoken, that are just burdening our hearts, Lord. May we lift our eyes to you. And may we be able to sing out this beautiful, these beautiful words, Lord. Because maybe we're still struggling physically, but Lord, you have healed us spiritually and we are whole. Maybe we don't understand 
Father, how whatever situation we're walking through seems good, but Lord, it's for your glory, and we may not understand, but we trust you, Lord, and we serve you no matter what. So may we sing these beautiful words together from the depths of our soul to our great God. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but He washed me white as snow. Father, again we come before You. Think of the lyrics in that song. Highly favored, anointed, and filled with the power. That is good news. When we are in Christ Jesus, we are blessed. We are healed. Thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. And as Whitney mentioned, Lord, When we think that things aren't going our way, when we think that we're in very difficult times, Lord, would you help us to surrender to your will and what you would have for us? That we would walk in your steps daily. Thank you so much for being good. Thank you for loving us. And that's the one thing, those are the two things that never change, Lord. You are good and you will always love us. We thank you for that. Lord, as we have the opportunity and the the chance to give today. We ask that you would bless these tithes and offerings today that help further your kingdom, not only here in the Chippewa Valley, but for the Bartons down in Mexico and for the many other missionaries that we support through your grace. We thank you for that. Thank you for the opportunity to give. May we do so with a joyful and a giving heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated this morning. Well, once again, good morning. It's great to have you. Thank you so much for coming and uh, joining us this morning. My name is Matt Selvig. We've got a couple of announcements, so if you uh, are interested this morning, while the uh, tithes and offerings are being received, we have uh, a fun little event coming up for the guys. It's called the Go Mad Men's Retreat, and it's this coming up weekend, next weekend. It's going to be uh, Friday night and Saturday. You can still sign up at the Connect Center if you uh, didn't get a brochure, there are some available now. So it's going to be a great opportunity for guys, you guys to grow in your faith. It's going to be at Arrowhead Bible Camp. As you can tell, great lineup of speakers. And so if you are interested, again, pick up more information, brochure at the Connect Center out in the uh, lobby area. Bible studies, there's still time to join one of the many Bible studies that are taking place during the week. Check them all out, again, at the Connect Center as well. There are a couple of options for you. list of the studies that are going to be taking place right here on Sunday mornings. So uh, take a look at those, and please come and participate in those on Sunday mornings. Chair team, here's an update there. Scott Soden will be in the atrium after the service near the Connect Center to help you sign up for this important ministry so we can continue to use the facility for multiple ministry opportunities. So here's the deal. After you service on Sunday mornings, usually we'll all stack the chairs up and whatnot. 
because we've got Awana, we've got uh, Sunday Night Basketball, which I'll tell you about in just one moment, but then those chairs need to get back in their spot. So we need volunteers to help out with the chair ministry. And kids, this might be a good opportunity for you as well to come and serve. So think about that. And again, if you would like to help out, please do so. Talk to uh, Scott Soden after the service today. Sunday night basketball tonight, 6 to 8. So come on, stop by, play some fun basketball right here at the church. Also, Wednesday night, casual conversations with PJ. Now, this is going to be taking place during Awana and uh, Nexus. If you want to, spend some time chatting with Pastor John about uh, anything that's on your heart there's a little bit more information. That is not a self-portrait of PJ, just to let you know. So just a quick clarification there. So Wednesday night, 6 to 7.30 p.m., no appointment necessary. Stop by and PJ. After the conversation, maybe he'll look like that, but I don't know. We'll see. Trunk or treat. Instead of normal uh, Awana on October 31st, Calvary is going to be hosting and providing a safe gospel-centered outreach to our neighborhood. Everyone that attends is going to be given the gospel message as well as invited to our normal Awana nights throughout the year. Displays will be appropriately themed, and people in attendance will feel welcome and loved. So if you want to, uh, a little alternative to the normal trick-or-treating, this is the, your, uh, your opportunity. And again, it was really cool because I think week one, there's like 122 kids for Awana. That is just amazing. Praise the Lord for that. So bring the kids out, and let's give them something. Yeah, we can, we can applaud that. Amen. So let's give them something that is uh, gospel-centered instead of what the normal theme of Halloween is this year, okay? Uh, and finally, yes, this is the last one. XYZ Fall Bus Tour is going to be taking place on October 9th. Call Pastor Fred or talk to Pastor Fred. He's right down here. I'm sure he'd love to chat with you after the service. Or stop by the church office by next Sunday for details and reserve a spot. So XYZ Bus Tour coming up on October 9th. Now, if uh, maybe I didn't cover all of the announcements, you can always look right in here. You should have received one of those on your way in. It's a connector, so make sure you check that out for more information. Discover link. If you are of the ages uh, for that, you are now dismissed. Pastor John with more. Thank you. One of the great privileges we have here at Calvary is to watch uh, young people and even older people hear the call of God to go into some form of ministry. And uh, these two young ladies, Libby and Rebecca Wood, uh, have been involved in a ministry, uh, Libby for two summers and more longer, and Rebecca for this last summer, uh, in serving the Lord at Snowbird Wilderness Outfitter, Outfitters Camp. And so they're going to give you a little highlights and tell you about what happened. Libby? Hey, yep, as you said, I'm Libby Wood. Um, as many of you know, I had the opportunity to serve for 15 months at Snowbird, the camp. Um, so through that, I interned. I worked last summer, interned through the year, and then worked this summer. Um, going into the summer, it had a lot more responsibilities because, like I said, I was an intern. It was really cool to see how the other staff, especially the newer ones, would look up to me and ask me questions. Um, so it was really cool to see how they like came to me with those types of things. Um, with the responsibilities came a lot more <laughs> exhaustion, I would say, and working through the year too, I came into the summer pretty tired, and then by the end of the year was very exhausted. So that was a major thing for me that I had to work through this summer um, with the exhaustion. So having Becca there this summer was such a blessing, definitely from the Lord, to help me get through the summer and to really um, just work hard and continue to keep going. Um, the two things he really taught me this summer are that I can trust him through anything, that it's not about me and that I can trust him, and he's going to help me get through it. And then the second thing, like I just said, was that it's not about me. It's about what the Lord wants in my life and the ministry that he's going to use me for. Um, for me, um, most of you know I'm a registered nurse and I was working at Mayo, and so I quit my job to go to camp. And I really feel like God just pulled me out of like that direction, and he said, like, I want you to focus on, like, your OB career. Um, so when I, like Libby and I have the potential to go to Africa this fall yet, we're still looking into that. Um, we don't have anything nailed down, but we're still trying to go. So we have some leads. Um, and there's a potential that I would be able to do like OB, like, so that's the baby and delivery in Africa. They said that I could work at that position if we get the okay to go there. And so I feel like God just really pulled me out of like the med surge and said like, I want you to focus on this because that's really where it, what I have for you because my heart for missions has always been for like the mothers and babies and that's kind of the direction that we're, 
thinking that we're going to head. And if not, I'll just try and find a job here in Eau Claire on, the, on an OB4 and get some experience in that so that I can then go on the mission field for that. So. Oh, yeah, this was super short, but I would love to share more if you guys have time. Yeah, we'll be in the atrium. Yeah, they'll be in the atrium after the service. The Apostle John writes in uh, 3 John, in his third letter, and he says, There is nothing greater than to see my children serving the Lord. And uh, no, these aren't my actual children, but they're my children, spiritually. And it's so wonderful to see God raising up people like you guys to to realize that of all of the opportunities there are for you from a secular perspective, you're using every one of them to accomplish an eternal purpose. And that's your highest call. So let me pray for you, okay? Father, I just thank you right now for Libby and Rebecca, and I just praise you for your call on their lives, that they have heard it, and they are responding to it, and they are preparing to fulfill it with your direction, with your training, and with the doors opening. Whether that be in Africa with the mission team that we have there right now that uh, has opportunities for them, or whether it be training for another place yet undetermined, we know that their confidence is in your goodness and they want to do all they can with their lives to ultimately bring all the glory to you. And I commit them to the days ahead that they will not overstep your plan, that they will not go beyond where you have called them for this day, but that they will step forward every day to learn what you have for them. And I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. God bless you girls. You heard Rebecca say that uh, after college and training to be a nurse, she had a very good job on the medical surgical floor at uh, Mayo Hospital. But when God steps in and says, my desire is for you to do this, We would all call that a sacrifice. Oh, she made such a sacrifice. If you asked Rebecca, she would not call it that. She might use a word like privilege. She might use a word like fulfillment but certainly not the word sacrifice. When we hear the word sacrifice, we wonder whether or not we're good at it. And we put it into terms where I think we, we suffer from a, a little bit of an exaggerated opinion of our own abilities to sacrifice. So, you're an avid deer hunter. Well, maybe not, but I am. And your wife says, I could sure use a date night tonight. So you sacrifice sitting on the tree stand to go out with your... Really? You call that a sacrifice? You see, what you define as a sacrifice also defines what you love the most. Because it's only a sacrifice if it's worth more to you than something else. And so we need to be careful when we come now to the end of Mark. Thank you for not cheering. <laughs> We've been studying Mark since January. We have two weeks left, this week and next week. 
And we come to the end where we're going to talk today about this servant king, who is this Jesus, about in the context of what was the sacrifice that he made. We sang about that. And everything we sang about was about the sacrifice of his physical life on the cross so that we could be washed whiter than snow from the sin that had left a crimson stain. Because Jesus paid it all. And when we think of Jesus and this act of sacrifice, we most often put it into the context of the sacrifice of his life. The sacrifice of his health, of his physical being, so that his body was ravaged and beaten, and the sacrifice of the rejection of people, the sacrifice of the shame of, of uh, hanging naked on a cross in f- full public view, the sacrifice of all of those things. And we tend to think of those as the real sacrifice. But in Mark's description of the crucifixion of Jesus on the cross, something interesting happens. If you recall from way back at our introduction of Mark, you would recall the the fundamental teaching that Mark, having not been a disciple of Jesus, needed to get his information about the life of Jesus from someone. Who was the source of his information? Peter. uh, Mark and Peter were good friends from a historical context. And Peter was the one feeding his perspective of the life of Jesus into Mark. And then Mark writing it down under the authority of the Holy Spirit to manage all of that. Because we believe here at Calvary that the Word of God is fully written by the Holy Spirit of God as his direct revelation to us. And it's without error even though it carries human personality in it. And so Peter was feeding Mark the information. So Mark's perspective of the crucifixion that he's going to write about carries Peter's perspective of the significance of the sacrifice. Let's read about it. Turn to Mark chapter 15. The Gospel of Mark, if you're unfamiliar with God's Word, is in what we call the New Testament. And it's the second book of the New Testament. And if you're unfamiliar enough with God's Word, maybe it's because you don't have one. And we would like to give you one. If you don't have a Bible and you would like to study it with us, we have some to give you. Would you just raise your hand right now and one of our men will bring it to you. And it's yours to keep. Okay? If uh, you just need one to use for today to follow along, then just put it back on the table at the back. But if you would like a Bible, we would love to offer you one. So put your hand up and it's yours and one of our men will bring it. Uh, Turn to Mark chapter 15. The, The whole 15th chapter deals with a lot of the scene of the crucifixion. We're going to focus in on verses 33 through 39 only and get this picture of Jesus hanging on the cross and discover the sacrifice of the servant. Would you stand with me, please, as I read this passage of Scripture? And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, Let's see whether Elijah will come down, come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him 
saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. You may be seated. Bear with me as I move through a progression of introductory remarks to give us context for the one principle that really needs to stand out to us today from this passage. I think the first thing we need to do, as we started to do earlier, was to define what sacrifice really is. What's the definition of sacrifice? If you look it up in the dictionary, there are two primary definitions. Number one is, it's an act of slaughtering an animal or person or surrendering a possession as an offering to God. That's definition number one. Definition number two is, an act of giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. Then go back to the illustration of sacrificing bow hunting for the sake of spending time with my wife. Okay? My attitude about that decision is motivated by which of those two things I believe has the greatest value. If I value my own preferences to be on the tree stand, I will discover that I will make the sacrifice because I also value peace in my home. (laughs) But if I value my wife more than I value the deer hunting and I honor her so that it's not a sacrifice, it's a privilege. There will be peace in my home (laughs) as a natural result. It all depends on your definition of value that you give to the two things that are in comparison as to which one you'll give up and which one you'll hold on to. We generally use the second definition to declare that we are pretty good at making sacrifices. Here's some examples. We, we will talk a lot about the sacrifices of time that we make. We sacrifice our time. I, I hope that you're starting to get an understanding in your own spirit and in your own attitude of the problem that exists when I make a statement like this that I'm going to make. Oh, I I realize, I just have this burden on my heart that I should sacrifice more of my time for Christ. Why is time invested in serving Christ called a sacrifice? And there's only one answer, because you value what you could have done with that time for yourself as being more important than serving Christ. The sacrifice is not really a sacrifice, depending on what you love the most. We do the same thing with our finances. Oh, yeah, I heard about that need at the church they have again. I guess I can sacrifice a little bit more and put a little extra in the offering. Wait a minute, I've got an idea. I've just got a harebrained radical idea to take this whole issue of sacrificing your finances for the sake of the Lord and put it into the right context. How about if everybody in the church that says they love Jesus with their whole heart and their whole mind and their whole strength and their whole soul How about if everybody that does that and then says that I also love others as I love myself put every paycheck completely into the offering and then we'll hire people to manage it back to you as a payee as you need it. That's revolutionary. But we say we love God that much. But are we willing to truly Give him to give up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more valuable. 
We do the same thing with our goals. We do the same thing with our personal plans, our preferences for stuff, our recreation time, our vacation time, and all the rest. And then we say, well, I guess I could sacrifice a little bit of that to give God a little bit more. How about if we do it the other way? We give God everything, and then we sacrifice a little bit of that for the sake of maybe pleasing self once in a while. It'd be a totally radically different perspective. Because every one of those such quote-unquote sacrifices make a value statement about our lives. We determine in every one of those decisions that what we will gain is of greater value than what we will surrender. And hence we call it a sacrifice. Now, that can be used correctly because Jesus used it correctly. He had something of value. But for the sake of something else that was of greater value, he gave up what he had. You can read about it in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, when it tells us that we are to look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy that would come as a result of his sacrifice of what he had was greater than him holding on to what he had, and it motivated him. So it's not wrong to be motivated by a value statement. But we must remember that our value statement proves what we love the most. The joy that was ahead of Jesus was of greater value than the preservation of his current status. The joy that he saw ahead of him was the reconciled relationship that he could have with me. And so he offered himself as an offering to God to satisfy the wrath of God against my sin so that that joyful relationship could be established. And that's why his sacrifice is so incredible. Jesus chose to not save himself so that he could save me. He chose not to save himself so that he could save me. If we were to read more of this story in the 15th chapter of Mark and you backed up two verses, you would read this. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Everybody wanted to see the sign of his power, of him coming down from the cross, and then they said they would believe in him. Jesus said, my true power is to stay on this cross because that's the only way I can save you. He chose to stay on the cross so that I could be saved. So that he could have the joy of my relationship with him. Now that may sound arrogant to some of you. Ugh, pastor. You're putting yourself in a pretty high position that Jesus gets joy from relationship with you. Maybe you're doing it out of jealousy because you don't get any joy from your relationship with me. I don't know. <laughs> I hope that's not true. But wait a minute. Jesus died so that our relationship could be restored. He created us in the beginning because he wanted relationship with us and it would bring him joy to reveal his glory to us. It is not arrogant to say Jesus gets joy from my relationship with him. It's what motivated him. But in order for that relationship to be reestablished, the consequence of my sin had to be paid for. The consequence of my sin is death. So the price of death had to be paid. 
In Hebrews 9, 26, the author says, But as it is, he, that's Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, so far, we've kind of summarized what we typically think of as the real sacrifice Jesus made. He sacrificed his life, his comfort, his... his uh, he, he, he put himself in a position of great pain and agony and sorrow because he saw something of greater value than his current status of being just a great teacher, prophet on the earth. He saw something of greater value than being just the God who reigned with the Father from glory. He saw a greater joy that that throne could carry, and that joy was a fuller revelation of his glory. Let me, let me just illustrate that for a moment so I'm, I make sure you're tracking with me because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to a point here, but I have to lay some foundation so you truly understand the point. If today your favorite football team wins and you had the unfortunate uh, opportunity today to have watched the game alone, how long will it take you, how long will it take me to get on my phone even during the game and send a text to my grandson in Madison. Did you see that? Did you see that? Because the full revelation of the joy of that event is not possible without sharing it so that you can experience the glory of that event with someone else. God is a God of glory. But what joy does he get from that glory if he doesn't share it with someone else who doesn't comprehend the fullness of that glory? Jesus had all the glory in heaven as the Son of God. But he gave up his eternal position he surrendered his personal preferences and he humbled himself to the point of being slaughtered as an offering to God, not just giving up something of value, but then fulfilling the first definition of sacrifice, to be slaughtered as an offering to God. Paul says it this way in Philippians, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He gave it all up for something of greater value. And what was the greater value? Ultimately, the greater value was the joy of sharing his glory with all of us. The joy of sharing his glory with us. Jesus sacrificed his position in heaven, his glory, and he sacrificed his physical life. But as indescribably hard and painful as those sacrifices were, the sacrifice to leave the throne, to come to earth as a human, the sacrifice to limit his glory so that the expression of it was limited while he was on this earth, the sacrifice of his physical life to pay the punishment of death for our sin, as indescribably hard and painful as that was, it could not compare to the hardest sacrifice of all. And the hardest sacrifice of all was this, Jesus sacrificed his relationship with the Father. He sacrificed his relationship with the Father. Peter feeding Mark the information about 
the crucifixion. The other gospel writers in Matthew and Luke and John share other statements that Jesus made from the cross, and yet Mark focuses on just this one, one statement from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Put that into the context of Peter, who is sharing that with Mark. And what had Peter just done? He had forsaken Jesus and denied him three times. And now, Peter saying, Ah, this is all about relationship, isn't it? What Jesus did is all about relationship. Yes, he had to pay the price for our sin, but why? So that relationship could be reestablished. It's all about relationship. Earlier this last week, I had a meeting with somebody, and they shared a rather disheartening, demoralizing story with me. Very simply, the story was that they had been to visit another church about a promotion that's going on, and they had spent some time talking to the pastor of that church, claiming to be a Bible-believing church. And the pastor asked this person, why are you doing this? And this person said, because I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And the pastor said, a personal relationship? What's that? How sad. That from the pulpit of that church every Sunday come messages about a sacrifice that Jesus made and misses the entire point of it that God has made it possible for us to have a personal and eternal relationship with himself based on a sinless perfection of his son because the penalty for sin has been fully paid. It's all about relationship with Jesus Christ. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the, in the Garden of Eden, a uh, Garden of Eden, <laughs> Garden of Gethsemane, different garden. I only visited one of those when I was in Israel. <laughs> there was an angel guarding the entrance to the other one. couldn't get in. The, when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Can we just stop for a word of prayer for a second? Uh, Cody, um, Cody was just carried out he must be having a seizure. And so we just need to pray for Cody and Sherry. Uh, I'm sorry, and for um, Kathy. Um, so let's just stop for a moment and let's just pray for them, please. Thank you, doctors for, and medical people for taking going out there. Father, I just uh, lift Cody before you right now as he continues to struggle with these seizures. And for Kathy... Thank you for the medical people that are here today that are headed out there to uh, give him uh, care that he needs. And uh, we just pray, Lord Jesus, that uh, your hand is upon them and brings peace at this time and that you will restore uh, Cody's mind and brain to calm function again. And we just commit him to your care right now because you are good. Amen. So Jesus talking to his father in the garden of Gethsemane. But notice from the cross, he uses a very generic term in the Greek, or the Aramaic here, a very generic term. It's not even the term for sovereign God. It's simply the term for a God. because the Father has already turned his back. Jesus has taken on the sin 
for which you and I are responsible. And God has turned his back and for the first time in his eternal and physical existence, their relationship is severed. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine that. Those of you that have lost someone precious to you in this life because of death can understand to a degree what that looks like and feels like. Whether it was a mother, a wife, a son, or a daughter. You know what that feeling of loss is like because that relationship can exist no longer. (laughs) But for the joy that was before him, for the joy that is ahead of me to see those people I've lost again because Jesus was willing to sacrifice his relationship with the Father so that my relationship could be restored. Let me illustrate it the way Tim Keller illustrates it in one of his messages. If after the service today, one of you comes up to me and says, I never want to see you or talk to you again, I'm going to feel pretty bad. I'm probably going to want to know the reason why you would say that. And it's going to hurt a little bit. But it's not going to hurt as much as if at the end of the service today my wife comes up to me and says, I never want to see you or talk to you again. (laughs) That's a lot worse. Why? Because the longer the love, the deeper the love, and therefore the greater torment of its loss. Tim Keller goes on and says this, but this forsakenness, this loss was between the Father and the Son who had loved each other from all eternity. Jesus, the maker of the world, was being unmade. Why? Jesus was experiencing judgment day. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was not a rhetorical question. The answer is for you, for me. For us, Jesus was forsaken by God so that we would never have to be. The judgment that should have fallen on us fell instead on him. Here's how author Max Locato says it. Here is the cup, my son. Drink it alone. God must have wept as he performed his task. Every lie, every lure, every act done in the shadows was in that cup. Slowly, hideously, they were absorbed into the body of the Son. The final act of incarnation, the spotless lamb was blemished. The king turns away from his prince. The undiluted wrath of a sin-hating father falls upon his sin-filled son. The fire envelops him. The shadows hide him. The son looks for his father, but the father cannot be seen. My God, my God, why? It was the most gut-wrenching cry of lonely... It was the most gut-wrenching cry of loneliness in history. Do not let Satan distract you right now. It was the most gut-wrenching cry of loneliness in history. And it came not from a prisoner or a widow or a patient. It came from a hill, from a cross, from a Messiah. My God, my God, he screamed, why did you abandon me? Never have words carried such hurt. Never has one being been so lonely. The ultimate act of sacrifice of Jesus 
was eternally essential for the restoration of our relationship with the Father. It was only by Jesus identifying with our separation from the Father that he could reconcile our relationship with the Father. Jesus took upon him the pain and the suffering and the agony of all of our sin and then capitalized on top of all of that to fully envelop the incarnation of humanity by choosing to experience the same separation from the Father that our sin causes in each one of us. Eternal separation of relationship from the Father. And the purpose of Jesus' coming was fulfilled to become like us in every way including the abandonment of the Father because of, sin, because of sin. Prior to his sacrifice, the holy presence of God was off limits to us. It was symbolized on this earth in the temple that represented the, the place where the holiness of God dwelt because there was a curtain that separated the holy of holies from every place person other than a qualified priest who had made a sacrifice for his own sin first before he could go behind that curtain and make the sacrifice on behalf of people. People were off, it was off limits to enter the Holy of Holies. There was a dividing line and in your life today there is a dividing line between the presence of an almighty God and you. And that dividing line that barrier, that eternally significant wall is sin. And the only way for that wall to be eliminated is for God to remove it. We cannot. And Mark tells us in the, in the, in the text that when Jesus joined us outside the curtain... When he joined us as one of those unqualified to be in the presence of God, when he joined us outside the curtain, God tore the curtain from top to bottom and opened the door to his presence through Jesus Christ. Relationship with him is possible again because of the sacrifice Jesus made. When somebody says, what kind of a sacrifice did Jesus have to make? You can talk about the pain. You can talk about the suffering. You can talk about the agony of the nails in the wrists and the feet. You can talk about the suffering on the cross, the thorn of crowns. You can talk about the beatings. You can talk about all of that agony. But until it hits us at the level of of a broken relationship with the eternal Father, we will never truly understand the significance of our own salvation that we now have possible through his death and his resurrection. Eternally significant personal relationship with the God who created us. And you cannot get that anywhere else. The Apostle John describes it for us in 1 John 3 when he says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies uh, himself as he is pure. Let me give you three quick points that are on your note-taking so you can say you filled in all the blanks. But online at our website and in the atrium at the life group section of our Connect Center, there are life group study guides that you can download, and it will help you develop a little bit better understanding of what this sacrifice of Jesus means so that in your life groups, in your personal devotional time, you can use that. But let me give you those three final points quickly of what it means now that Jesus has 
restored this relationship if you come to him by faith and repent of your sin and put yourself into the hands of God through Jesus Christ. John tells us very clearly that we are set apart as God's children in eternal relationship with him. Jesus sacrificed his relationship with the Father to secure our relationship with the Father. That is so mind-boggling. What is it the kids do now? They go... Mind blown. Jesus sacrificed his relationship with the Father to secure my relationship with the Father. And it's eternal. And because of it, as children of God, we have access to God. There is no longer a dividing wall to keep us from him. It has been torn down. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The curtain in the temple kept people from being destroyed by the holiness of what was behind the temple, uh, behind the curtain. Anybody who would have gone behind that curtain would have instantly died from the holiness that was there. None of us had access. Hebrews tells us that Jesus became our curtain and in his death, The curtain was removed because now God sees the perfection of his son in me so I am qualified to boldly have access to God. Powerful. And finally, the application to our lives. John says, everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we are now free to stop sinning. We are free to stop sinning. The author of Hebrews goes on in that passage where he talked about the curtain being torn through the flesh and body of Jesus Christ. And he says this, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. That's a tough verse. It's a hard one to close on but it's a necessary one to close on. Jesus Christ became the dividing curtain between the holiness of God and our sinfulness. He paid for our sinfulness so that the curtain could be removed and those who are in Christ have access to the holiness of God. Except except those who have used the sacrifice of Christ simply for what they think is fire insurance from the judgment of hell, but I can continue to make the decisions I want to live my life the way I want to, and I can sin and I can do all the other stuff I want to because it pleases me. And the scripture is clear. If you continue to deliberately sin after you're made aware of the truth of that sin and the truth of what Jesus did to establish your relationship, you have no more sacrifice that you can call on to make you accessible to God. You will be suffering eternally because you didn't understand your salvation. Do not dabble with sin deliberately. Do we still all do it? Yes. We're talking here not about a one-time occurrence. We're talking about that continual, deliberate, yeah, but pastor, you don't understand what my wife is like. I have to have a girlfriend. Pastor, you don't understand what my husband is like, so I have to be on Facebook Messenger with that other woman. 
Pastor, you don't understand how hard it is to pay my bills. I have to steal from my job a little bit here and there in order to get through. Pastor, you don't understand. Fill in the blank for wherever you are. What things are pleasing and serving yourself today that you are deliberately doing because you do not understand that in relationship with Christ, he has promised the fulfillment to your whole life for all eternity and we cannot go on deliberately sinning. That's what relationship means to God. And that's why he sacrificed his own son to pay for it. Can we just spend a minute in prayer? Our Father, I thank you. As you know, I... uh, I struggled over this uh, message, and now I know why. Satan himself tried to interrupt it twice or more because I don't know what's going on in the minds of all these people that were listening or pretending to listen while they thought about other stuff. But Satan doesn't want this message to get across. Jesus Christ was abandoned by the Father because we were outside of relationship with him because of our sin. And Jesus, your love was so incredible that you allowed yourself to step outside of the curtain of relationship with the Heavenly Father to join us in that abandonment. We deserved it. You didn't. You voluntarily did it for our sake. And when you did, you tore the curtain down and said, follow me back into the presence of the Father. There is no other religion in the world. There is no other faith community in the world. There is no other means of getting to God the Father except through Jesus Christ our Lord. He alone is the way to follow to get back to the Father for all eternity. And you may be here today and say, I've never heard that before. I've never done anything with that before. That's me. I'm outside the curtain. And Jesus voluntarily stepped outside the curtain to make it possible for me to follow him back to the Father. Today, I want to choose to follow Jesus. I want to repent of my sin. I want to repent of the way I've tried to run my life. And I want to follow Jesus back into an eternal relationship with the Father. And you say, Pastor, that's me today. Would you just lead me right now in a simple prayer that will cause me to do that? Would you just put your hand up right now if that's you and I'll lead you in a prayer. If you say, Pastor, I I need to know that I'm following Jesus into the permanent, eternal relationship with the Father because I've never done that before. Is there anyone? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. You can put your hands down then. You guys don't have to say this out loud unless you want to, but you don't have to be embarrassed, but you, I don't force you to say it out loud. But would you, you guys three that just raised your hands, would you just bow your heads right now and say this the way that I'm going to say it, okay? Dear God, I know I'm guilty of sin and that I am separated from you by that sin. And you sacrificed Jesus on the cross to pay for that sin. I accept today Jesus and I choose to follow him. I reject all the ways of sin and I choose to obey Jesus and have a relationship with God. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Amen.
Hey, in heaven right now, the angels are rejoicing. How about you? But remember, those of you that just cheered because you know the reality of that salvation, do you understand now the responsibilities of that salvation? To represent Christ as your number one relationship and never sacrifice that relationship for the sake of something else you claim to love more than him. Please stand and rejoice as you sing the truth of this song.
Amen. Now, let's go out and live like it. How about it? Can we go tell the world that we are children of God and we live like that in front of the world? Amen. You're dismissed. Oh, oh, oh.